Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Lawyers, judges, the court, there's a mystery behind all of them, yet there is a way to work with all of them successfully. This episode is about myth versus reality in the family law business. And we have as our perfect guest for this discussion, attorney Lamor Mojdahiazad. I practiced that for you. You You got it. You got it. It was perfect. Okay. So you're going to completely enjoy Lawyer Lamor because that is what your handle is on one of your social media, Loyal Lamar. And so we're going to really get into the most successful way to work with lawyers, judges in the court, and the opposite. So let's get started, Lamar. First of all, thank you for joining us. I know you're eternally busy, and I really appreciate this. My absolute pleasure. Okay. Here's what people say when it is absolutely necessary to go to court. It's the biggest myth out there. You know, the judge is totally going to do, find in my favor. He's totally, he or she is totally going to understand everything I'm talking about. And your ass is grass. True (laughs) or not true? (laughs) That the, say it one more time. The judge is completely going to rule in my favor. I know he's going, he or she will understand everything that I want. And I know it makes sense. So therefore, I'm going to be granted everything I want. Oh, completely untrue. I'm so sorry for anyone who believes that. I'm so sorry for them. So why do you think people believe that? Why do they get that in their heads that they are completely right about what they're asking for? I think it's because they see their story only from their perspective. And they think that repeating the story will make the situation look exactly the way that they see it. They don't understand that these judges are just like you and me. They're regular people. And on top of that, they're seeing story after story after story. They have 10 cases in the morning, 10 cases in the afternoon, right after lunch, right? And you only get, if you're going in for a request in family law, you get 10 pages double spaced to tell your story. They don't know the history of the relationship unless you've done a great job of summarizing it and it even matters or it's relevant. They don't know or feel the emotions that you feel when you're telling this story through the paperwork, right? And it's very hard. It's very, very hard, especially if you decide to represent yourself to bring that story to life with the judge, right? They want to know what is relevant, what fits in the law, and sometimes what you think is relevant and might get you a winner in court is not really what actually will get you to win. And I put win in air quotes when I'm talking about family law, right? Because there's no winner. Everyone loses, right? Once you step into that courtroom, because these judges, you know, you have three kids you're talking about, 10 pages double space to tell your story. Come on. No, no, they're not going to know every single thing. But if you do a good job with an attorney, you might get something, something close to what you requested, but never walk in thinking the judge is going to see things the way you thought, because that is almost never, ever the case. You know, within all of that wonderful information you just provided, Lamor, you said something that I want to piggyback on. You said the judge won't have the same emotion about your case as you do. And so how is a judge supposed to get past your emotion? How does a judge rule? What's the framework in which a judge has to work to make his or her rulings? Right. They have to work within the parameters of the law. They cannot go outside of the power that the law gives them. There is discretion of the court right? They can make rulings that they believe are, if we're talking about custody, in the children's best interest based on what you've provided and what the other party has provided. But again, those 10 pages, right? They need to fit that within the law. If something happened seven years ago, it might be something that has left you wounded. You've never healed from it. Every time you talk about this relationship, you bring it up because to you, it's relevant. To judge, it happened seven years ago. 
You're here about visitation. What is your schedule? What is the other party's schedule? What are the children's schedules? That's what I want to know. And then maybe you can convince the judge to give you more time and the other party less time based on other things that still fit into the law. So custody, best interest of the child, very, very broad. Right. But right. Seven years ago, we don't. So something like um, both people's work schedules would somehow influence uh, a, a parenting plan, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Not, I have fed the kids every day. I'm the one that does their homework. I'm the one that puts them to bed. I totally get when people, and generally it's women, say that. I totally get it. But this is a new day uh, when there are two households. And so everybody ha- kind of has to change the way they live a little bit, right? To accommodate a parenting plan that allows each parent to actually spend time with the children and not to sub out to a nanny or a housekeeper or the other relatives. Yes. That's absolutely, absolutely right. And I think that couples forget that, you know, we want to include those facts. I change their diaper. I feed them. I do this. But you have to recognize you're going into court because you are no longer with the other person. So the dynamic between the two parents is going to look completely different now. There are two households. What, you know, some people think, okay, you've made a meal for the kids before. That might be because you were the, you were the parent who had the time to do that. Now that there are two households, everyone is going to adjust. It's not just an adjustment for the children. It's also an adjustment for the parents. I mean, what, you know, I I tell parents sometimes, do you think the other parent is not going to feed the children? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Do you think that just because they've never ever made dinner that they and the children are going to now starve because you're no longer living together because that's just not what it is. And the courts understand that too. It's now two households. What are we going to do? What makes sense? Okay. And that makes sense. So how do you, two, two things, how do you get a judge to like you in terms of even, even listening with as open ears as possible and an open heart if, if a heart gets to take place in any <laughs> of these rulings? How do you get a judge to like you? I think that there, the answer is twofold. So you have to show the judge that you are credible and focused, right? If you want to bring up something from seven years ago, put in one sentence and follow it up with, I am not trying to throw mud on the other parent, but I believe this is relevant to how we are going to do things moving forward. Or something like, I don't mean to disparage the other parent. I just believe that the court might find this relevant. If the court finds it relevant, they will continue to ask you more questions to get to where they need to get to, to make a ruling. Another part of that is, if you want a judge to like you, you need to spoon feed them. You need to spoon feed them. Tell them what you want and you tell them how it fits into the law. Best interest of the child, once you're going into court for something and you know that the law revolves around best interest of the child, your declaration, your arguments need to be child-centric, co-parent focus. And if the judge says, I don't care about this thing that you told me, even if it happened last week, It's not going to change my mind about anything. Move on. You start talking about something else in your argument or if you're testifying or whatever it is. Listen to what they want to know to get you the order that you want to get. So simple. You know what? That's so spot on, so simple. How about this? You mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, Max. 10 pages double spaced in terms of submitting evidence, submitting the paperwork for whatever the the hearing is about. So I was with a judge from the downtown courthouse who said, here, let me make this simple, Judy, because I'm in monthly meetings um, with this one particular judge in one of my, um, my professional groups. And he said, if you can say it all in two pages and it's clear, my question is, give me a pen. Tell me where to sign. This is right on. Would you please address 
when attorneys want to write the Bible, the mm. encyclopedia, mm. so that it looks like they're working hard for you. <laughs> how does that really look to a judge? And how, how practical is it for a judge to be able to wrap their heads around a volume of information? What kind of timing does the judge have to even review your case? Oh, great, great question. Now, I'll say this from the client perspective. If you have an attorney who is submitting three different pleadings, 500 pages of evidence for you, that is, I would say, a red flag. They likely don't know what they're doing and they want to run up your bill. That is, in my perspective, when you're talking about family law, that is what I truly believe and what I've seen in practice. You don't need to do that. Just like you said, give me two pages, tell me where to sign. That's what they want to see. They want to read. So I'll, let me let me backtrack. And this is the process for what we call a request for order in family law, right? Um, so I want a change in custody or I want initial custody order, support orders, whatever it is. You have a four-page form to fill out. And you can attach a declaration that is up to 10 pages double space. I recommend using Times New Roman because you can get more information in 10 pages, right? Uh, you know what? And I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other party has a 10 page double space responsive declaration that they can submit in response. And then you get a chance to then uh, file a reply declaration that is max five pages double spaced. That's on pleading paper. So I always recommend start with page zero so you don't waste any lines and then do page one. So it's a full page, whatever. So that's what you submit to the court and the court. Okay. Reads all of those pleadings together. From what I understand, that's what the court does. They don't read them as they, as they come in. If they do, then a judicial assistant is reading it, taking notes for the judge, reading the next one, taking notes for the judge. And, you know, a lot of times the judges will come out and say, here's my tentative. Based on what I've read from your side and the other side, this is what I think I'm going to grant. Sway me. They'll either have their questions they want to ask you or they'll allow you or your counsel to argue your points, right? So two pages, if you can get it all down and it's all relevant in two pages, please do that. That's the way to get your orders. The courts don't need to know the history of your relationship in some of these cases. Some, it's exactly what you said, as simple as give us your schedules. Tell us why or why not it work, why or why it does not work, right? So a lot of the time when I am putting together requests for orders, that first page, you know for sure the first page is, someone's going to read that first page. I don't know about page eight, but page number one, they're reading it. So I always have a section that just first page requested relief, bullet points of what I'm asking for. The rest of it is reasons why I think I believe my client believes that these requests are, you know, fit into the law. You know, if it's the best interest, interest of the child, that's what I'm focused on. Right. But you know, they're reading the first page for sure. Don't put the most important thing on page 10. What are they, come on. <laughs> I don't want to read 10 pages and then wait three days and do the, the other one and what I saw. That's r ridiculous. Ridiculous. Just think about what they have 10 cases in the morning, 10 cases in the afternoon, give them what they want in the first couple of pages. You can reference other pages or other exhibits, but just give it to spoon feed them, spoon feed them. So you said something so very important and I really need to repeat it. And you said in the very first section of your declaration, just bullet point what you're asking for. So in a nutshell, the judge knows what they're dealing with. Yep. And then everything else is support why you're requesting these bullet points. Mm hmm yeah, yeah. It, it makes perfect sense because we have very busy judges. And my understanding, Lamore's, maybe there's an hour to prepare, but then I logistically don't understand how this works. So a judge comes in in the morning and knows they have X number of cases for the day. When did they get to read through the briefs for any of the cases? You know what? It's a great question. We all have what we think they do. <laughs> So I believe if they are, there are some cases that you can tell the judge is really in it. They remember the kids' names, 
right? Mm. They remember their ages. They remember the last time you were here. They've been waiting for this request, right? They, they know, right? And so, so, you know, they read everything the second it came in. There are other judges. There was one judge, I forget her name. I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even mention it, but she was notorious for not reading any pleadings until you got there and she would sit at the bench. She would say, I have petitioners, for example, I have petitioners requests for order, respondents responsive declaration and petitioners reply. Is that all you filed? Great. I'll be right back. She'd go in the back all of seven minutes and she'd come out with notes. You know what she did in that seven minutes. No, we all knew. She reads, is, she reads page one. She reads page one of the RFO. What are you requesting? She reads page one of the responsive declaration. What do you disagree with that I actually really need to focus on? Then to look a little bit at the reply, she'll look at maybe if you put some headings in bold, which I recommend that you do. She'll sit there, let you argue, and she'll go off of the argument, which is very unfair because <laughs> those, you know, those pleadings, those 10 page declarations, you work so hard on them. You've been charged hourly for them. And it seems unfair, but listen, you need to put the story in front of them in the easiest way possible. And sometimes some people even, um, you know, they'll submit a proposed order. So they'll put that bullet point list on a document they call proposed order. And the judge will then have, you know, a draft of something that could potentially become the order. Who doesn't like something that's already oh typed my out? God, yeah. that's brilliant on yes. the part of the attorney who would. Yes, do and that. the judge, you know, they'll scratch off the word proposed. And then they'll start, you know, scratching off orders or adding to them or whatever, and they'll sign mm -hmm. it and. Here you go. And then you don't have to do um, a findings in order after hearing a lot of the time if you do do that. Which is a formal yeah. recap of what the judge yes. ruled on, correct? Okay. And then right. one attorney writes it and then says mm -hmm. it to the other party. Everybody signs off. If you disagree, you mm -hmm. had that opportunity. Maybe there was a mistake from what the... Right. Okay. Exactly. Right. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Here's another myth. We're going to switch to the attorney. The meaner, the better. You'll definitely win if you hire the meanest attorney. Myth or reality? That is a myth. You will definitely get the biggest bill of your life if you hire the meanest attorney and you will likely lose all credibility with opposing counsel, with your ex-partner, and with the court. A hundred percent. I believe that a hundred percent. Now, do mean attorneys, mean people sometimes get what they want because other sides, other people fold maybe, but this is family law. You really need to work on getting an order that actually works for your family. Right. But you know, when people call and they say, I want someone aggressive, I'm like, Oh, okay. I'll give them this consultation, but I'm definitely referring you out because that's not my style. It doesn't get you to win. You turn that on, you know, they all say the bulldog. I want a bulldog for what? For what? You, you need an attorney who is competent, someone who you feel comfortable speaking to and telling all your deepest, darkest family law secret, secrets, whatever it is, right? And someone who can put all of that in a very concise declaration for the court so you get what you're asking for. If for any reason they need to get aggressive or mean, Every attorney has that personality trait in them. Every human does. We will turn it on. A good attorney will know when to turn it on and will know that having that on all the time, BS, doesn't get you anywhere. You know, you brought up, was it the bulldog? The, you yes, the bulldog, word? yeah. Okay, so I was going to ask you about this. These pejorative terms that are associated with lawyers, the clients bring up, this is what they want. Yeah. They want the bulldog attorney, the pit bull attorney. Well, first of all, I love these dogs. I mean, who They're doesn't so cute. love a cute little bulldog? <laughs> and now we've got the, the French bulldog, the American bulldog, yep. the British bulldog. Yep. And the pit bull attorney who, Tia Maria Torres on pit bulls and parolees on Animal Planet, has created a love fest with pit bulls. Oh. So I think we need to turn this around. And my whole goal in doing amicable divorces mm -hmm. is that if you actually need an attorney to speak for you, and sometimes you absolutely need it, you cannot speak to your spouse for whatever reason. And the attorneys, that's their jobs, right? right to speak right. for you 
to each other. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. So why do people think the meaner, the better? It's really the myth of zealous advocacy and the myth of the only type of lawyer people really, you know, everyone thinks they're familiar with is, you know, the criminal defense attorneys, the prosecutors, Mm. they see those mean, aggressive people on TV and they think they know every single lawyer in all the land and they just don't. Those personalities working for the government, having a quota of people you want to put away, that that personality is completely different than someone, and, and you should hope that it's different, than someone who is kind of in charge of navigating where your family's going to go from here, right? You don't want that. That is not the goal of your family, you know, uh, the the type of family law order and the way you want to move forward with this family that's no longer, you know, one sole unit together. It's now two different, right? You don't want, that's, that's not going to be amicable. Even if you want it to be, if you get an attorney whose personality is just pitbull, but you want an amicable divorce, I guarantee you they're going to mess it up for you somehow because the opposing attorney might not like the way they speak to them because they're going way off kilter for no reason. That's the whole thing. There's no purpose behind it. For what? So what do you do if you find yourself in court with an overly aggressive attorney who, I don't know, since I don't go to court, Mm -hmm. corrupts when they know they're not supposed to, objects when they may not need to just to keep stirring the pot, or presents information or evidence that just isn't true? How do you handle it in court? I am known to just call it out. I am very, you know, I keep it very professional. I don't speak out of turn. I don't interrupt. I've seen that, you know, go left way too many times. It doesn't help you. And judges will remember that. If the other side is interrupting you when you speak, they will remember. And I've had judges say on the record in my cases, she did not interrupt you when you were speaking. So you will let her speak. Oh, wow. Right? Because they will see, you know, People say things in court when you're sitting there like, I need to, I, I need to say something. Like you're just sitting there like, uh, you know, sometimes clients are like uh, hitting you on the shoulder or, or tugging at your shirt or writing something on a notepad, which is another thing. I give my clients a notepad and a piece of paper, like just write it down. I'll get to it. You don't have to tug on my t-shirt, right? I, 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 I know how to respond, but just put your notes right there just so I can keep focus. But I call it out. If someone interrupts me, I'll just sit there, take a breath. Your honor, may I continue? And they know, they know the best place in fam. Listen, the one thing you have to do in family law and the best place to just keep your cool, even if you, you know, you have to practice this is in family law court. It's going to get you far. You're going in there to what? Possibly get more time. Tell the court you're more fit to have more time with your children. Keep your mouth shut. Don't get aggressive. Don't have an attorney who's aggressive because judges also know that a lot of times parties like to hire attorneys who share their personality traits, right? So your credibility, yeah, your credibility can go right down the toilet if you hire that attorney who everyone knows is unhinged. And there are a few of them. There are a few of them. There are. There there really are. We all know them. Yeah. Um, What does, what does it look like in court? So there's two tables, you Mm -hmm. you know, each lawyer sits at a table with their client. We know what the courtroom scenes look like on TV and the movies, but do you get up from your table and walk around or do the attorneys more so have to stay at the table? What a great question. Okay. So you... You sit at counsel table, the attorney, so there's two tables stuck together, but the attorneys sit closest to one another and the clients kind of sit next to them on the outside, right? So the attorneys are closer and the parties are farther away from one another. We have the judge right in front of us who sits a little bit higher. We have the witness stand. We have the bailiff to the right in a corner behind us. We usually have an empty juror box because there's no, there are no juries in family law, only bench trials, bench hearings. And then we have the judicial assistant. 
if you are taking testimony, which does not, does not happen all the time in family law, it definitely happens in trial, but the shorter hearings, we aren't always taking testimony. Um, the, the witness will be on the stand testifying and it'll depend. Sometimes I get up and the judge is like, have a seat be comfortable. No worries. Like just sit there closer to the microphone. So my court reporter can get what you're saying. I don't care about the show. Right. They don't care because think about it in, this is another, another myth because of all those criminal law shows. You're not putting on a show, right? Juries need the show because they don't know anything. You're giving them all their tools. You're giving them the law. You're giving them the facts. And then you're throwing some color into there, right? You're getting a little bit fun and whatever it is. You're storytelling to them. With judges, you're storytelling, but you're not teaching them the law. They know where the things you're saying fit into their decision-making, right? So it's different. You don't need to, you know, if you have a restraining order hearing, maybe you'd like to make motions with your hands or ask the other party, show me the distance between you and the other party before they, you know, got physical or whatever it is. But you don't need that in family law. So it's not, you know, sometimes I say it's not as fun as a criminal trial or whatever it is. Well, what is as much fun? I mean, come on. But let me tell you, they still get crazy still. With all of our butts in the chairs, they can still get wild. Because like you said, you know, the other side, You don't want your client to speak in court. That's another thing. If you have paid an attorney, keep your mouth shut unless someone asks you a question. Don't speak. Don't speak. A lot of people do speak out of turn, the clients and the court, you know, they're sitting there because more than anything, it's a credibility game, right? So if you're presenting to the court, I am, I provide a stable environment for my children. What the other party says about our arguing and me being loud is completely untrue. That party is just trying to gain an unfair advantage by saying that and painting me in this light. Why are you yelling at the attorney? Why are you speaking out of turn? This is a court of law. This is the one place you should be able to, to, you know, kind of hide that. And some people can't control themselves and they get, you know, I, I can tell that certain orders are made because of that type of behavior in court and they should be made because of that type of behavior in court. So clients really at times can't contain themselves. And I would assume think that they can tell the story better than their attorney because they're living it. That is exactly, exactly, exactly right. And they'll want to interrupt because they don't want the judge to hear whatever. That's not true. That's not true. And the judge will say, you'll have your turn. Right now, right now, it's this person's turn. Hang on. They do it again. The judge is like, you know what? You're interrupting me. I don't even know or care what you're going to say next. I need to hear this person finish. And then I'm going to ask your attorney a question. If I need to hear from you, I will ask you a question. Do they do that? Um, yes. Or do, would a judge actually say, trials, I mean, the hearing's going fine, trial's going fine. Mm-hmm. But they actually want the party themselves to maybe respond. They, they do that, huh? Yes. The time? Yes, they will say yeah. yes. Yes, they will. You know, there are certain things, for example, um, that uh, attorneys or clients or paralegals, whoever is preparing the, the paperwork, just kind of forget to include that are very important, right? You get off of work at five, school ends at 4.30. There's an after school program, your kid can stay in it. You didn't tell the court how long it takes you to get to the school. So do I need to make this visitation order start at 5.30 or 5.15 or 6.30 because you can't get out of work? And, you know, they can ask the attorney, but a lot of the time you'll even hear the attorney say, I think my client would be able to better respond to that question and provide you an answer. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so at least that too. people that need to hire attorneys and really need the court's help. And this is the way I always position it. The courthouse isn't moving. It's not going anywhere. You don't need to threaten going to court. Mm-hmm. When you need the judge's help, they are there ready to help you. That's right. Yes, 100%. 100%. So, all right, and there are times when the judge might want you to talk and you will have that time. So, so more so now, this tells me you really need to hire the right attorney 
who's going to understand court dynamics, respect for the judge, respect for the process, respect for opposing counsel. Spot on. So that the best ruling can take place. That's in right. In both people's favor. Yes. Just give them reasons to, to give you orders in your favor. Don't give them reasons to take away things. <laughs> like, don't. Okay. So I'm going to pose another situation to you that I hear all the time, and I'm sure you do too. Somebody's married to a narcissist, <laughs> undiagnosed, <laughs> undiagnosed, but married to a narcissist. And they've been in court a lot. And somehow the judge keeps finding favor with the narcissist. I will get cases like that when, when people just simply don't have the money for ongoing legal fees and they're very bummed out that the judge keeps finding favor with the other person. Lamour, tell me whether it's my imagination or not when I'm listening to the person who comes to my office and sometimes it seems like that person is kind of a victim person Mm. and maybe somehow that doesn't play out well in court. Maybe that person loses their temper a lot, isn't organized enough. Is there any rationale and truth in the court is always finding favor with the how the other party who's a narcissist because they're smooth, they're personable, they're likable. That's what I get. Do you get any of that when you first meet a client? I hear the narcissist thing all the time. Everyone in LA claims that they are married to a narcissist. Are some of them? Probably. Are all of them? No. And sometimes the person telling you that is the narcissist, right? So you're sitting there like, oh God, come on. Like what? Okay. All right. And this is where you want to focus them. What are the facts? Because I think something people don't know is that public policy in California favors joint custody, joint legal custody, joint physical custody, 50% visitation time. You're going to court. And if you want something other than that, you need to sway the judge in that direction. So I think a lot of people still to this day go in there and their argument is, I'm the mom. I'm the dad. That's their whole argument. I'm the mom. The kids should be with me more often because I am the mom. Dads. I have father's rights, which is... (sighs) I laugh at the term father's rights, to be honest with you, because it's really just parental rights. I don't care if you're the mom or the dad. You mm-hmm. should have equal rights you know, outside of whatever other facts exist, right? We need to start at that point, which the courts do, right? You have a lot of fathers who come in and they're like, I need time with my children. I'm the father. They need to have their father in their life. And they're making this big, you know, a lot of noise just about that. And I let them talk, but I tell them, I agree with you. So does the court. Why aren't you getting that time? And what is your schedule? What is your relationship with the kids? Let's see what we can get you. A lot of them just think, I'm not going to get any time because I'm the dad. Now, people, men still live with that myth. And I try and explain, even though I don't go to court, that's not what I see. I see the assumption that Let's start at 50-50 and let's see how this works in your particular situation. Right. And so I, I tell men, I don't really think you need to worry that you're a man and the court's not going to give you time. But if you are worried, this is when you absolutely need legal advice. Mm-hmm. You need to go to an attorney that goes to court. And you need to listen to that attorney talk about what it's like in court and how basically you should expect some type of ruling. Of course. Yes. No, I completely agree because they come in and they think, you know, for five years, we've been doing what mom has told me we can do as far as visits. Well, why didn't you call me 
four years ago, four and a half years ago. You should have called me four and a half years ago because you've now created this status quo Mm. of mom is telling me I can only see the kids on the weekends. Well, why? I don't know. It's just what she told me. So I I listened to her. I was scared to go to court. You hear that a lot from dads. Oh, you know what? I can appreciate that. I can't. I'm still living under that old. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens. It happens to fathers a lot because they, they also think she's the mom. So she's going to get this order, right? She is the mom. She did take care of the kids all the time. They'll admit it, but they also don't understand that's okay. But you also have time after school when you pick up the kids where you're making dinner for yourself. You can make dinner for the kids, take care of them, have them do the homework. They can sleep at your house. It's not a dangerous place because a mom isn't there. You're going to learn too. You're going to mess up a little bit. As long as the kids aren't in danger, the court will gladly give you the time. If the logistics make sense, the children are not in danger. The court will give you that time. They don't believe it. And, you know, unfortunately, they that four-year status quo quo is, is a thing that's very common. They've just done this thing. So they'll go to court and they've had visits every other weekend, maybe, you know, one night every other weekend in the court, you know, they want to go to 50, 50 time, but those kids, their bond with that parent is limited to that one visit, one overnight every other weekend. So what the court will sometimes do is listen, I, I think the children will be fine in your care. It is in their best interest to have you in their life, for you to be a constant in their life. It brings them stability. We love it. But they're only used to seeing you every other weekend for one night. So let's gradually step up the schedule. Let's give you a couple, you know, let's give you two overnights every other weekend. Let's see if giving you middle of the week visits makes sense because maybe you can't get to the, you can't get the kids to, uh, to school on time. So let's do some dinner visits. Every Thursday you have dinner with the kids. Even now I've seen Zoom visits, right? If they live too far away, they'll just dedicate a night where they're on Zoom for one hour and that's part right. of their visit. You know, there are so many different things that you can do. And I'm, a, I'm very much a fan of working it out without going to court, right? So if, if mom or if the other parent doesn't allow you, whatever that looks like, to see the kids, you guys are afraid to go to court, whatever it is, Make sure you're getting something that's fair because if you know it's unfair, you lived that life, you're part of the dynamic and the relationship and and the bond with your children and it seems unfair to you, just go speak to a lawyer. There are tons who get free 30-minute consultations. Just tell them what's going on and what you want, right? Because even what you want might actually be way too much. If you've only seen the kids for you know 12 hours, 24 hours every other week, for four years, an attorney might tell you, you know, that's, that's, we can't go to week on week off with that. We're going to have to propose a step up schedule too, right? For the court to understand you also get it, right? It's a drastic change for anyone. It's a drastic change for the parent too, right? right? You have to adjust things to make that work. So you're walking in and the system, public policy, All of it favors joint custody, but the logistics also matter. The status quo, which we, you know, the status quo is what has gone on since you have not. Yeah. Yeah. What you said was so important um, a few minutes ago when you started with, okay, dad is scared. And mom, I don't mean to throw you under the bus, mom, because I, I do get where you're coming from when you've been the primary domestic parent. Oh, of course. This yes. is a huge change. So, so honestly, I, I think we both understand yes. uh, women who are listening what this feels like. But to prepare you for what the court wants to do is the point of this episode. Yes. So to just extend that one thing, Lamore, that you said about if you're unrepresented and you've been to court a few times and dad out of fear of losing all time with the children has not really resisted the every other weekend schedule, but then all of a sudden has more courage, has more confidence and wants it to be 50, 50 that they've set precedent. Mm, That's what it is. I didn't even think about it that way. They've set precedent. Yes. Yes, 100%. And listen, that narcissistic personality, whatever whatever it's actually called, I don't even know, but a lot of people turn on a different personality when they're actually in court. I have had opposing parties pull out my chair. 
to let me sit down at council table or open the door for me. They'll get ahead of me and they'll open the door for me. And it's like, mm, we all know you're putting on a show, but you know what? You're, do, you're doing way too much and the judges aren't stupid. They see that too. That's very odd behavior, right? You're just look like it's weird. It's just weird, right? And they see that too. They see it too. Now, putting on your, you know, being on your best behavior, like I said earlier, does it work? Yes. So the court wouldn't look at that as, oh, this person is so amicable. This is going to be a really nice hearing. (laughs) They don't think like that. I guess not. I guess not by the laughing. That's really funny. (laughs) So (laughs) thank you. All right. Now, what does a good divorce look like when you have two attorneys representing the parties? Because the parties, uh, for a variety of reasons, there's so many complicated assets. They just need people with experience to help them break it down and to divide evenly. Um, and there's, there's just a lot of issues and we have custody, um, visitation time issues. But what does a good divorce look like with two attorneys trying to help the parties work this out? So that's a great question. So I think a lot of people also don't know that you never have to set foot in court in family law. You can do all of it outside of court from the initial filing to the final judgment, all the orders in between can be done outside of court just by filing paperwork because you agree on issues. Now, I think that an amicable divorce, what it looks like to me is the attorneys on both sides being committed to getting this resolved outside of court. If everyone commits to that from the beginning, the parties too, obviously, right? And when I say the attorney, they're speaking on behalf of their client, right? Um, I think that every step of the way, even if things are complicated, you're not, you're not resolving it with the first proposal you sent out. You are dedicated to getting there still, right? The entire, the entire pendency of, this, of these litigations should be proposals back and forth. We're going to have a meet and confer. We're going to have a conference call. Let's figure this out. Cool it off. Work. See if this schedule that we just agreed to that maybe you're not happy with, see if it works. Try it for a couple months. We'll set a date on the calendar where attorneys and counsel will meet and confer and talk about what's going on. And let's figure out if we need to change something. Maybe Thursday dinners don't work. They just don't work for anyone. The kids have something they want to watch. And they're annoyed that they have to be out with their parent. Maybe it just doesn't work. Let's figure it out. But you know, the, the commitment has to be that we will resolve this because we know the facts of the case better than everyone. We know the parties better than everyone and the judges just don't. So I think that if you commit to resolving things outside of court, if that's your first option every single time, that is a good and healthy divorce and will get you to a good and healthy family dynamic afterwards. So do the parties themselves have to take the responsibility of saying to their lawyers, we do need your help. We have some complexities here, but we really don't want to go to court. Is it kind of up to the parties to direct that as well? Is it cooperative with everybody? Where are we at? Do we want to keep this out of court? How does that dialogue go? Yeah, that's a great question. So everything, you know, the clients are our boss, right? <laughs> so we have, to do, we have to do as they want. But it's also, it's also our duty to guide them in the best way possible to get them what they want. And if you have an attorney who doesn't even mention the idea of resolving things outside of court, that's a red flag to me. If you have a consultation and they don't even tell you you have the you have the choice or option to resolve things outside of court of court, that is a red, red flag. If the client doesn't want to do that, that's a different story. It's out of your hands, right? If they're coming to you to file something because for three months they've been asking the other party if the kids can be enrolled in this school for next year and we're almost at the start of school, you need to file something. Now, that doesn't mean that before the court date you can't still try to resolve it right? Because there are a lot of times where there's a conflict and I tell the clients, listen, I'm going to file this in two weeks by the time we're done, you know, finalizing the paperwork. 
But when we get it back, that court date is going to be six to eight weeks out. Let's get the court date. From now until then, let's start sending proposals and seeing if we can resolve it. You can take that hearing off calendar. Take it right off calendar. But you at least know if you're going back and forth and you're not agreeing to something, you have that day in court where, you'll, where, where you will get some sort of resolution. Whatever it is, I don't know, but you will get resolution at least by that day, that deadline kind of. On the other hand, what does a bad divorce look like? One party wants to resolve out of court. The other party just wants blood. Mm, mm. You know, so, yeah, so sometimes you just can't help it. Sometimes you're calling an attorney because you have a court date. Someone just served you and you have a court date and you have to deal with it that way. So, you know, you got to meet your deadlines. You have to show up in court. Doesn't mean you can't resolve it. And you can always tell the court, I've tried to resolve this. You can't divulge exactly how you have, right? You can't divulge settlement um, talks or discussions, but you can yeah. say, I, no, you can't say specifically. Why? Why? Uh, confidentiality. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So there are settle- settlement communications and mediation talks that you cannot specifically tell the court what was offered or what well, I know offered. in mediation talk, you can't. Yeah. Settlement but- communications too. But that goes for what you said to your lawyer. You can't really divulge. Well, no. What the attorneys even offered each other through their through their oh. uh, through their through their parties through their clients. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, what are some red flags? So, uh, a person is investigating attorney. So, you want to talk to a few mm-hmm. attorneys to see who you gel with the best. Mm-hmm. What are some red flags to know you're going to get a bill that you will take the rest of your life paying? <laughs> That's a great question. I would say if your attorney's office is on the 70th floor in Century City and it's a corner office and they have the whole floor, <laughs> that, that $100,000 retainer you just handed to them, it'll be over by the 25th of that month, I would say. <laughs> and you're going to get invoiced the, the next month, the next month, the next month, whatever it is. I would say that's a red flag. But you know, some cases, especially in LA, they need that type of manpower behind them, right? Um, so red flags, I would say that if you have an attorney who is sitting there and just kind of yes manning you in a way, right? The first question you ask, right? Uh, this person is this way and I want to show the court and I want to get sole custody and blah, 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 based on these things. And if the attorney says, oh my God, we're going to go into court and we're going to get that for you. I can't believe you've been living like this. Red flag, red flag. It's just never, that's never, you're never going to get every single thing that you want in court. Red flag. Now, another thing I would always, I tell, you know, my friends, if they're hiring attorneys for what, for whatever purpose, I always tell them, ask that attorney if they're going to be working on your case. Because you might be consulting with the attorney whose name is on the door but they have tons of associates, they have paralegals, they have legal assistants. Ask them, are you going to appear in court with me or is it an associate? Are you going to be writing my paperwork or is it an associate? What does your legal assistant do? What part of my case do they do? I don't think most people would even think about asking those questions. Yeah. 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 And you know, especially in LA where I practice, it's just... I've seen it. I've seen it. They consult with the attorney and they never speak to that attorney again because the, you know, the first year associate is actually working on their paperwork and they don't know. In terms of cost, I mean, so much goes down when you're initially uh, interviewing an attorney, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the client, you know, so much goes down and, and, and money is brought up. And I, I wonder if some people are even reluctant to ask the question, what do these ballpark numbers look like? And what can I do not to go to 50,000? What can mm. I do? How does this discussion of money take place? That's actually really funny that you ask. I had a, um, oh man, I had a consultation a long time ago where the client said, and how much, what can I do to keep the cost down? And I said, wow, what a great question. You know what she said? She said, I read that online to ask. <laughs> so cute. It was so cute. I love, I appreciated it so much. And you know, there, that's a great I question, that. right? Because, you know, in LA, especially attorneys, hourly rates are anywhere, a good attorney from three fifty dollars to $1,000 an hour, right? Yeah. That's a lot 
of money. So you need to know how they charge. Do you charge in six minute increments? What, you know, what happens when my retainer is out? How long do I have to pay you again? Or are you going to, you know, fire me as your client? Um, when they ask, so when they do ask, how can I keep uh, my bill down? I let them know, listen, we spend a lot of money on certain costs, which include e-filing some documents. If you're able to go to the courthouse, I won't do this if I have a deadline. I will never give paperwork to a client to file. If there's a deadline, I need it he filed. But if there's something that we need to have filed, there's no due date. I'll let them know, listen, instead of paying the, you know, whatever, 15 to $45 or whatever it is, if you want to do that yourself, go ahead and do that. Email me instead of getting on a call because your email is going to take me less time to read. It's going to be focused, or at least I would request that it is, right? Give me the bullet points of what you're thinking and what's going on. I will respond to you. Takes a lot less time than us getting on the phone and you doing what I tell you not to do in court. And you're giving me the history of this and that. I'm charging you. I'm charging you. So don't do that. I tell people all the time. And you know, go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) No, I was going to say, I was going to, sorry. I was going to say that I tell people when I have to release Mm. an attorney, when I say, look, I'm at the end of what I can do for you. You really do need representation from this point on. But even though on my flat fee, I don't deal with time. I, you are going to spend more money with the phone calls and the emails if yeah. you want to regurgitate stories, be emotional. It's just, this is where you're going to eat money up. Am I right? You're absolutely right. And I, t- I have to tell clients sometimes to get a therapist. Yeah, because that's because they're so emotional. They need help. Yeah, and they're cheaper than us. Go get a therapist. That's true. Go get, and they will be able to help you. I can't, there is a limit to what I can do. I would love to sit there and give everyone advice. Trust me. Trust me. I'd love to do that. But you're hiring me as your attorney. I need to get you results. I need the relevant facts. I need to filter out everything you're saying so that a judge can give us what we want or opposing party can give us what we want because we're right in line with what the court's probably going to order. So, you know, there are certain things. They, the kids ate ice cream for breakfast the other day. What do I do? I don't know. The court's not really going to care. Talk to a therapist. Talk to, have the, you know, talk to the other parent. I don't know. But isn't this what you're supposed to do, Lamar? I'm I'm your client now. Um, Uh Aren't you supposed to uh, make sure that the judge knows that they're being fed unhealthy food and go to bed after playing games at 10, 11 o'clock and they're only in grade school? Doesn't the judge need to know that, Lamar? Wow, that was great. Yes. I will let the judge know if it's relevant to what we're presenting to the court. If it's relevant, then fine. If in four months it happened five times and we tell the other side, you know what the other side's going to say, it'll never happen again. Or that doesn't happen in my house. What are you talking about? Yeah. The court's also going to say, listen, it's two different households. Do your kids never stay up late at your house? Because the other side can say it's so restrictive at their house. The discipline is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. When the kids come to me, they finally feel free. They get all their homework done. That's what the court wants to know. Are they getting to school on time still? Are they missing assignments? No? Okay. And they like ice cream? You can have ice cream. I'd love to have ice cream for breakfast. Is there a health issue with the ice cream? That's a different story. Is there an attendance issue because they're sleeping late? That's a different story. When clients present things like that to me, I tell them, listen, we need to make sure that you do not look petty in front of this judge. Ice cream for a seven-year-old one time in a month, they're not going to care. The other side is going to see something that's probably going to work. Oh, they, they did great in school or they had a performance that day and they wanted ice cream or we went to an ice cream party and I had extra ice, whatever it is. The court's not going to care about that. But if they have health issues because of it, maybe the court will care. I'm not going to focus on it. Might, I might mention it. Okay, well, you, know, you did bring up something interesting, though, health issues, which mm-hmm. concerns me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how far will the court go in considering health issues? Because I know a lot of parents are health conscious. Great question. It's something that comes up in LA divorces a lot. So we're so yeah. picky. We're so yeah. we're so picky. And you know, <laughs> I just really I, I love us for our idiosyncrasies. I really do. So again, that dynamic that used to be present in the in the family unit when parents were together. Sometimes, again, this is LA. Sometimes you have a mom who's very health focused and you have a dad who's at work all the time. And after work, he has a networking dinner. He comes home at 11. So mom is in charge of all of the food for the kids all the time, all the time. And dad does not know how to cook. Does he starve because mom didn't pack him a lunch? No, he'll go to La Scala and get whatever he wants. He's good. He's still oh eating. This He's is an upscale. Good. By the way, La Scala is an upscale restaurant in Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> Since we are going to talk about the idiosyncrasies and the shallowness. <laughs> but, uh, right, yeah. right. So, you yeah. know, Give father some grace. Give him some grace. The kids are going to eat out a couple nights a week because for them to spend time with their dad. It's the way it has to be. It's the way it has to be. And guess what? You don't want dad to miss that networking dinner. I promise you. Because Because your support might fluctuate because he didn't get to meet that person and sign that deal. So give him grace. The children, kids are so smart. They are so, so smart. They know I'm going out with dad tonight. I'm going to eat whatever, whatever it is. What are you going to do? Have the judge ask the kid? They're going to say, oh my God, I love dinners with dad at mom's house. We always have a salad for lunch. And then for dinner, we have like a piece of meat and I have to eat my broccoli. No, we're not allowed to have chocolate. But at dad's house, I love when we go to this place. I love, you know, I love Toscanova. I love this, but whatever it is, right? And it's like, come on. The kids aren't complaining. I know that for sure. But you do have parents, speaking of health, you do have parents who say, my children have gained weight. Oh, right. I'm not going in there and saying my children have gained weight unless you tell me you saw a doctor that said the weight is an issue. I'm not doing that. I refuse. You know what? I actually did have um, an unrepresented client who went through several requests for order hearings post-divorce. Mm. And we did, on one of the hearings, present photographs of his son who was truly 20 to 30 pounds overweight as an adolescent. And he, he was so concerned because the food at mom's house was all carbs Oh, I see. Yes. And dad really wanted his child to be healthy and he had him in sports and he was concerned about the, his child, his son being made fun of. Mm-hmm. Because you know how kids can be mean. When yes. Yes. And the sports thing is an issue and bullying is an issue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think health, it, it really, I don't know, this is me. I really think it should be part of the conversation But I guess you have to pick and choose your arguments for the judge too, right? Yes, 100%. Ice cream, I don't care unless unless it's a health issue. Now, what you just presented, that I can tell you. So health is part of legal custody decision-making, right? What doctors are they seeing? What medication, treatment, all of that. So when you tell me, you know, my kid is so overweight, they kicked him off the team. My kid is now being bullied. He used to be so popular. Listen, the the kids are a-holes, right? But your kid is now being bullied because we can't control what's happening at your house. I could see, you know, a court setting certain rules up. They can't really tell you what food to buy. That's the other thing. They can't tell you what food to buy. Then there's issues of finances, access, all of that. But they will tell you you know, make sure they get to their team, whatever it is at this time. Let's take the kid to a doctor and let's see what the doctor says. Whatever the doctor says, both parents have to follow. That's an easy way for the judge to get you to do those certain things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there are limitations in in terms of what the court can really talk about, because again, everything has to be framed in case law or law in general, and then in case law. Right. 100%. 
Okay. So let's end the, I've had such a good time. I love it. <laughs> I really, really have. Um, let's end on a very positive note. And that is, what are the good signs you want to look for in an attorney when you're shopping for the right representation for you? Great question. You need to be comfortable with your attorney. So if you feel that the attorney is maybe judging you based on what you're telling them, they're kind of, you know, you know how I said they're telling you you're going to get everything you're asking for. If they're on the opposite end of that too, maybe that's a little bit of a red flag for you as well, right? So you might want to look for someone who's listening critically and asking you questions during that consultation because they want to see how to get you to your goal, right? And make sure that your goals are realistic. They're managing your expectations, even from the consultation, right? They're not selling themselves to you. You're already in a consultation with them. They're already an option for you. A good attorney is giving you this 30 minutes to also see if the two of you have a good dynamic, right? So if they're being too pushy, I wouldn't do it. If they're dodging questions like who's going to do the work, I think that that's a red flag. If, you know, they are asking for a retainer that's some something like $100,000 and they won't split the payment. What's a, normal, that, what's a normal retainer? So I would say a normal retainer, depending, right, everything depends, is somewhere between $5,500 and $10,000. The way, the way I run my firm is I'm a solo practitioner with support staff and I work in LA. I have a lot of high net worth clients, a lot of complicated cases, some that aren't so complicated. But I don't have the manpower for those bigger cases that a bigger firm really should take, but the client clicks with me and they want to hire me. Sometimes I don't have the manpower for that. So what I will do, and I listen, another good sign is if the attorney is giving you other options to go about what you're trying to get. Right. So if I see that the client and I are vibing, I would say if we're vibing, then I would let them know, listen, your case is going to require a lot of manpower. I'm happy to take on the case if you want to sign up with my office. But what I often do is I will co-counsel with a bigger firm. Mm. You will have to later pay their retainer and we will work together. And that also helps to kind of control your bill with the bigger firm, right? Maybe I'll take on just the custody and visitation issues, anything that's dealing with the kids. They'll figure out splitting the businesses, splitting the real estate, all of that. And you can manage the, um, the case better that way, your invoices with the bigger firms that way. Okay, so something I've been wanting to ask and, and, and uh, forgot, now I'm going to. So you're, you're going in to see attorneys, you're interviewing attorneys, you want to see who's going to work best with you. You're in either a community property state, which means mm. anything purchased with monies we made on our jobs from date of separation to date of marriage, that becomes community property general, generally. Right. Okay, so, and, and then there is, uh, what's the other state if it's not community property? It's equal distribution. Yes, equitable, of yeah. Equitable distribution of assets. It's kind of the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when, when, when you as an attorney say, well, I want to be able to, to you know, to, to meet your goals, to see, well, isn't the only thing that can really happen in assets and debts to divide things according to the law? <sighs> oh, just a whole nother hour <laughs> that I've just opened. So let me tell you this. If you go to court, that's yeah. likely the only way okay. it will end up. If you are nego negotiating outside of court, you can split things up however you want. As long okay. as you sign on the dotted line and all those waivers are in there and acknowledgements, you can do okay. whatever you want. So the attorney will tell you exactly what you just said. Okay. So you go in, I want at least 75 or 80% custody of the two kids. Mm -hmm. I want to live exactly the way we have been living. So whatever I get in child and spousal support, it has to be enough to pay all of my bills and more. I need to keep the two horses. <laughs> Oh God. I divided an entire zoo one time, but go ahead. You're kidding. Did you really? <laughs> no, I'm not, no I'm seriously? Not. Yeah, I'm dead serious. 
they had a petting zoo or an actual zoo of animals. It was an entire zoo. Okay, people didn't pay to see them, but on their property. No, people, no, 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 it was their own zoo. Okay, it was <laughs> a zoo of their own making. Um, so when you keep it out of court, yes, of course, you can create the, um, the settlement agreement that works for both parties. So I guess when you're initially talking to a client and they're saying that they want more than 50% of anything, whether it's custody or things, assets, of course not debts. Nobody wants 50% of that, of course not. Um, how should an attorney respond to that unequal distribution? The way I usually respond is, let me first tell you the process. Let me first tell you what the public policy is. And let me tell you, let me describe to you where everything you're telling me fits in. You need to bring them back down to earth. If you're in a consultation with an attorney and everything they're telling you is making you really happy, (laughs) (laughs) I would run the other way because there is, you're just not going to get a settlement agreement. Nothing is going to be exactly how you want it to be when it comes to family law orders. It's just not going to happen. And even when you're negotiating, you know, you're fighting over one night a week. I mean, how much of that $50,000 retainer, $10,000 retainer do you want to spend fighting over 12 hours, 24 hours? It doesn't make any sense, right? So a good attorney will tell you, listen, I understand, but if public policy is 50-50 and I haven't really heard, of course, the attorney should also understand the clients don't have all the time in the world to tell you everything. We don't really know exactly everything that's relevant, whatever it is, especially in a consultation. It's very open-ended. But if you want 80% time with the kids, I need to know why that makes sense to you because the judge is most likely not going to order that until you give me something compelling. So I usually ask clients, well, what if you get 70%? And I see their reaction because as much as they're vetting us, as much as the client thinks they're vetting the attorney to hire the attorney, we're vetting the clients too. I don't just take every single person I give a consultation to if they want to hire me. I will refer clients out. I will tell them we don't seem to be aligned. I know a better attorney who will be on the same exact page as you who's better suited for this case and I'll refer them out because you have to manage expectations and you should want an attorney who is managing your expectations even from that first consultation or you will see a bill that you will be so unhappy with and results that you could have gotten yourself proper. (laughs) Okay. And lastly, um, so you go in, you choose your attorney, they tell you what the retainer is, and let's just say it's Mm $5,000. And somehow at $4.25 an hour, which I find to be the current going rate for really good, solid, experienced attorneys, $4.25 an hour. Mm -hmm. Divided into five thousand dollars, how many hours is that? That's not that many hours, and so to say, which I hear a lot, and I completely understand. Nobody knows, mm-hmm. the, you know, the average person has no clue what they're getting into, where the time is spent, at least initially setting everything up. Um, you know, where did the money go to? I was Judy. I, I, I was just asked for another retainer of 5000 The attorney didn't do anything. Well, what's your case number? Let me go look on the website. What has been filed already? Oh, well, I can see the petition's been filed. It's been served. A response was filed. And then there was this. And then there was, you know, then disclosures were filed. So things were done. It may not feel and look like you've accomplished anything. I kind of want to address how should the client perceive when their money's been spent well and when they feel nothing's really been done, how does that get resolved and equated so the client feels confident that they're well served? Great question. A lot of times, if a client feels like they won, it's money well spent. If they feel like they lost, 
oh my God, you ripped me off. Why was I charged for this? What is this? I'm never paying that invoice. I'm going to write you a horrible review that you can never take off the internet unless you waive all of the, you know, whatever it is, all the charges for this and that. Listen, what you see on the case summary is not all the work that the attorney did. There's correspondence going back and forth. There are e- you know, the phone calls, mm-hmm. the text messages. There we go. The we go back does, to the phone right? calls. Right? And the client does. Right. You can control that. When a client asks, how can I keep the bill down? Email me instead of calling me. Remember that also when the other side gets in touch with me, you're being billed. When I ask you. Right. Right. right you're being billed. When I ask you, when I ask you, when I tell you. I need a 10 page double space declaration and draft one needs to come from you. This is what I need to know for draft one. Why did you send me a hundred pages single spaced that started in 1992? Why did you do that? As your attorney, I need to read it all because you sent it to me. (laughs) And now I have to filter through it just because my work product at the end of the day was 10 pages double spaced. And you could sit there and write that in two hours. Doesn't mean it only took me two hours to do that. I had to review that entire binder you sent me. I had to review the entire zip file. You're not doing yourself any favors. If after I told you, I need to know what's happened since you have separated from the other party and you start 20 years before that, why did you do that? What are you doing? That's your entire retainer. And I tell people often, when we go to court, I can almost, you know, we can't guarantee anything in this line of work, but I can almost guarantee you're going to blow through your retainer because court is where I cannot gauge what's going to happen time-wise, right? I don't know if it's a remote appearance. We might be, you know, if you're number one on the docket, that doesn't mean they're going to see you in that order. We might be sitting there through lunch, right? And you might think my attorney is just sitting in front of the computer waiting for us to be heard. And I just got charged for five hours and all they did was sit there in front of their camera and did nothing. I need to charge you still for those hours because I am dedicated to your case for those five hours and I'm not working on anything else. I'm sitting there waiting to be called on, right? When we were doing all of our appearances in person, that travel time, Oh, right. right. Yeah. Oh, God. An yeah. hour and a half in traffic to get downtown. You're being charged for that. I'm not doing legal work, but I'm in the car. Right. Getting and to your case. Meaning you can't do other work on yep. other cases. This is this your is- time. Yep. I'm okay. dedicated to your case. And I can't tell you if we're number one on the docket that we're going first. Sometimes clients get lucky and we're, we're out of there in 20 minutes. Wow, you got so lucky! Uh, that is that that is really great. Yeah, it, yeah. I remember those ju- those ju- um those days for jury duty? I mean, it was oh like, man, oh it, man, it, yep, beyond belief. We are totally over time, but <laughs> of course so we are. Enjoyable. Lamore, thank you for everything you said. And so here are my takeaways. Keep it simple. Even if you have a stressful relationship, try and keep it as simple as possible in the divorce process. Hire an attorney who's going to keep your feet planted on the ground, Mm -hmm. give you reality, not feed into everything you want if it really doesn't comport with the law of your state. You know, ask for reality as much as possible. Uh, use your time with your attorney to make progress, not to rehash the past if you don't have to. And really look for an attorney who, how how am I going to say, doesn't want to really fight if fighting isn't necessary. That's right. That's right. All right. These are really good takeaways. I'm going to put these all in the blog too. (laughs) thinking as you were saying that. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm going to put these in a blog. I like to do the takeaway. So Lamore, how can people get in touch with you? Thank you. I've had so much fun here today. You can get in touch with me while on social media. You can find me at Lawyer Lamore, L-I-M-O-R on TikTok, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, my full name, Lamore Mojahiazad. And you could just Google my name and find me and get in touch. And her name will be in the show notes as you're know, <laughs> listening to this. I had to practice phonetic uh, pronunciation and thank, thank you for taking you so me through that. Thank you. 
So this has been delightful, and I hope you can carve out some time in the future. If you have any really interesting cases, Lamore, mm. that you think would make an excellent conversation for a future episode, please get in touch with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we all have, I mean, there are groundbreaking cases that happen that I think the public should know about. I love it. Absolutely. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us as always. I hope you found this episode interesting and uh, fruitful for your future in, in the family law arena. You can get in touch with me through my website or my email address, Judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 